All right. Ah, let's look at this this example. This is some code I adapted from um, Dave Taylor's site, whoever Dave Taylor is. I have the I have the font bigger, so this the, the font shouldn't be this big. But uh, ask Dave Taylor. All right. And this does some of the additional form controls that we didn't do last time, um, as well as um, a review of some of the other ones. All right. So, for example, the first one is a combination of a text box and a checkbox. I don't believe we've done uh, checkboxes before. So let's say if I want to search about PHP, I can choose to either search ask only search ask Dave Taylor or not so if I click off that it'll search the whole the whole interwebs and there is the response for a PHP search but if I say only search Dave Taylor it only looks through his particular fields all right or his particular site. So let's look at the code that does this. All right. Here's the first form that we have, or we're looking at, or we're calling Google Search. The input name equals Q. Uh, remember again that that's the name that the server is expecting. Um, I, we couldn't call it anything else because the server isn't expecting another name. And if we did, it wouldn't work. Likewise, there is an option in, in Google, uh, in advanced search, to search within a site. And the name that it's expecting is site search. Now notice here's our checkbox. A checkbox, remember, is not like a radio button in the sense that it's not like it because every checkbox works independently of any other checkboxes you have. So. Think of the checkbox as being a yes or no option. For example, hint, hint, if you were doing a system for ordering pizza online, the kind of crust would be a radio button, maybe, or a drop down, because you can't have both thick and thin crust. All right? uh, the size would be a drop down or a radio button, because a pizza has to be small, medium, or large can't be, I want a pizza that is part small and part large. You know, it doesn't make any sense. However, when you consider the list of toppings, the list of toppings aren't related to each other. What, what, what choice you make for one topping doesn't influence the choice you make for another. So you can get pepperoni and you can still get sausage. Or you can just get sausage or just get pepperoni or not get any of them. All right. So in the case of toppings, Think of them as a, just a series of yes or no questions. Do I want this topping? Yes. Do I want that topping? Uh, yes or no. So again, this is accomplished through the input tag. The difference is, is that there is a type of checkbox instead of a type of text like we had with that. Um, the name is site search. Again, that comes from the what the server is expecting. The value of it is the site that I want to search in this case. That's what's going to get passed on the query string. And I default the checked property of it to check. So when I first load up this page, that defaults to check. Then I click OK. Again, if we look at the query string, Oops. we'll notice Q equals PHP, my text box was named Q, site search equals askdavetaylor.com. Site search is the name of the checkbox, and askdavetaylor.com is the value of that checkbox. Now watch what the query string looks like if we don't check that checkbox. Go backwards and uncheck it. <coughs> All 
Pardon me? <laughs> uh, if we don't check the checkbox, then Q equals PHP, the value of the checkbox doesn't appear because we don't we didn't select that option. All right, so we've told we tell the server if we want that option or don't want that option. All right, let's look at some of these other forms and see if there's anything interesting. I can, by the way, apply some properties to these if I want. A text box, for example, I can uh, supply a a a, um, a a size and a max length. Those do two different things. If I say a size equals 20, that relates to physically how big the text box is. It doesn't relate to how much I can put into it. So if I say size equals 20, that's something that's probably better handled via CSS because that's the physical appearance of it. So notice if the size equals 20, that's how big it is, but I can type in here all day. The size only relates to the physical uh, size of it. And again, that's probably best handled through CSS. I can also supply a max length. And what that relates to is how many characters I can put into it. So I said the max length of 20, when I get to the end of the line, no matter how much I type, and, and no more goes in. So that might be an attribute, attribute you might want to set. For example, if you had, um, you know, a, a place for a phone number, right? Phone numbers are typically, what, 10, 12 digits, something like that. You wouldn't want necessarily someone to type in a whole, you know, 100 characters worth of stuff, right? So you could limit the, the, the max uh, length of it to that. All right. The other ones are largely review of stuff that we went over before. Here we have a set of radio buttons. Again, what links them together is the fact that they have a name of site search. That's what makes them act like radio buttons. All right, it groups them together. And the values relate to the value that it will have if that particular one is checked. So, in this case, when I go to the page, I can search uh, this uh, search box. I can search for stuff, and I can limit it to just LCC site, W3 schools, Dave Taylor site, or the entire web. Right. The last one is a dropdown. As we notice, the dropdown does not use a. Uh, input tag, it uses a select tag with a list of options. Keep in mind that the options, each option has two parts, the value, which is actually what the script is going to see, and then there's the, the, the text between the start and ending tag, which is something that makes sense to, to users, all right? Again, because, you know, someone looks at LorraineCCC.edu, it might not be obvious to them what that is you know, if someone visited this page from, from elsewhere. All right, so we have a full explanation that that is Lorraine County Community College's site. All right, so what's between the start and end option is a, uh, a description, something that would make sense to anyone reading it. What the value is is what the script needs. And in this case, the script needs the actual URL. All right, interesting thing that you should observe, all right, it doesn't matter how we get the, the data there, as long as we get the data there in the terms that the server's expecting. So we use the text box and a radio buttons. We use a text box and a drop down. We use text box and check boxes. It doesn't really matter as long as we're giving it in the way that the server's expecting. And again, on a typical project, you will be doing both or you'll be part of a team that does both. And you have to coordinate to make sure what you're calling it on their form, the person who write, wrote the server-side script is, is calling it uh, you know, in their script. Questions about this part? 
let's look at our next example here. Here's sort of my commentary on the clear button situation. Place order, gigantic and big, clear order, small. All right. Uh, I did that sort of to counteract what we saw on the LC schedule site where the clear form button is bigger and first, and therefore a lot of people click on that accidentally. All right. Let's look at what we've done on this form. On this, this, this is still just one form. What we've done is we've broken the form down into field sets. Think of a field set as being sort of like a list of related fields on the form. You know. Um, in other words, this is the form, let's say, for placing an order or, or paying for an order or creating a new account or something like that. All right. I've divided the form into three different sections. The billing information, which is, you know, the name, address, and all that. Information about the credit card. And then finally, a password along with comments. So there's sort of three logical pieces. And I put each of them in the, in the field set. That has two purposes. That, that is something that you can do for accessibility. That helps someone um, that is using a screen reader access this form to sort of put things in context. All right. It also, again, can be used for styling. You know, this kind of looks nicer than the kind of form that we had before. All right. So, let's look at the code for this one. We'll skip the styling for now. All right. Because I want to talk about these two fields at the bottom. One is a password, and notice as you type in the, the characters aren't echoed, and the other is a comment box where you can type in a free form multi-line comment. So let's look at those two things first because I think those two are the last couple of form controls that we're going to talk about in this section anyhow that we haven't talked about before. So if I look here, the password, instead of input um, type equals text, it says input, input type equals password. All right. That simply means that it will work like a text box, except as you type in, someone can't see what you're typing. I have below it a hidden form field. And this is something that won't really make sense uh, until you do server-side scripting. But sometimes you want to pass data from one page to another. All right. But you don't necessarily, it's not necessarily data that the user is going to enter. All right. For example, you know, in Angel when I log on, I want to pass my user ID and password to the next page, to the login script to make sure that I'm who I say I am. In that case, that's something the user has to type in. In other cases, there are things that you want to pass that don't come from user input, but are something that might be like system generated. All right? And you can use hidden form fields for that. Now, this one, sort of meaningless. All right? Uh, I'm just passing good morning. All right? But it could be other sorts of information that, that are important. All right? So a hidden form field allows you to pass data without requiring the user to enter it in. All right. Um, again, if, if you do, uh, if you take like for example CISS 243 and you do some um, web database stuff, you'll notice in ASP.NET there's hidden fields that are used for the server to pass things uh, from page to page. One thing about HTTP, I'm going to make a statement. Uh, and, and, and I'll talk a little bit about it, but again, it will become more important when you do server-side scripting. HTTP is what's called a stateless protocol. All right. What does that mean? In a nutshell, that means that every request, every time the client requests something from the server, is sort of a brand new request. They're not grouped together. They're not treated as a unit. Within the protocol, every request is, is just simply a new request 
unrelated to any other requests that happened. Now, logically, we, we know that there has to be a catch somewhere, right? Because what that is implying is that a web page can't remember anything about me, right? If every request is a brand new, fresh request, then how does Angel know as I go from page to page to page um, that I'm Mike Zellers and I'm an instructor and therefore I teach these classes and I can do these certain things on uh, for those classes. What I'm saying is the protocol itself doesn't allow for remembering stuff between requests. Therefore there's other mechanisms in place that do allow you to do that and that's called state management. The query string is an example of one of these. The query string is one way that we can get data from one page to another. All right. There's a couple other methods as well, and one of them is these hidden form fields. These hidden form fields can be used to pass data and to help the web server relate a bunch of requests together. So you don't have to log on for every single page that you visit. You know, that would be unworkable. All right? But the protocol itself doesn't allow for any sort of state management, but there's other tools that do. All right. The last thing that we want to talk about is, uh, with, with regards to forms, is, um, with regards to form controls, is the text area. The text area, again, is also not an input tag. All right. It is the word text area, and I can specify the rows and columns associated with it. However, again, that's just a physical how it's going to look thing. It doesn't impact how many characters I can actually enter into it. All right. So in other words, I said that this is going to be 10 rows and 40 columns, but I can type in as much as I want and it's not going to stop me. It just keeps scrolling and adding to the scroll bar. All right. Now you might ask the question, well gee, how do I limit how much they can put in? Um, that has to be done via JavaScript. So we'll, we won't talk about that now. We might, we might come back and revisit that when we, when we talk about JavaScript. Alright, so I think we've hit all the basic controls. Including one that we're never going to use, the clear button which is an input tag with a type reset. Now let's talk about accessibility for forms. And then lastly we'll talk about styling of forms. There's two big things that you can do for healthy accessibility. All right. The first of which is breaking the, the form down into uh, field sets. Let me give you a, a, an example of when that would be especially useful. Sometimes a person has a different shipping address and billing address, right? Um, their, their bills might get sent, especially in the case of an organization. Their bills might get sent to a post office box, for example. But the, the actual goods you can't send to a post office box. You have to get it, give it, send it to a physical, actual physical address. So I might have two addresses on a form. I might have a shipping address and a billing address, all right? Then maybe I have a checkbox that says use the shipping address for the billing address or vice versa. All right. Now, if I were going to do that, I would have address, city, state, and zip. Address, city, state, and zip. I guess I could make one shipping address, shipping city, shipping state, shipping zip, and the other one billing. But the other thing I could do is I could put those in field sets. And that will help... Uh, people using a screen reader to sort of say, okay, I'm in the address, but oh, this is the address that's in the shipping address section. How do you make a field set? Real easy. You simply put your field set tag around the form fields. So for example, here's the billing information. I have my field set around the form fields for the particular items. All right. Associated with the field set <clears throat> is a legend. And that legend appears along the border of that field set. So I said the legend for this first field set 
was billing information, and therefore if we look on the form, billing information appears up there. That's the one thing that we can do. The other thing we can do is we can use a label tag. Now a label tag is kind of similar to what we do in tables. All right. The label tag allows us to associate a piece of text with a form control. Again, thinking of how you interact with a form versus how someone who is using a screen reader does. At a glance, you know that this text box is credit card number, right? How do you know that? Well, because the text is right there. It's right next to it. What else would it be? All right. Can you imagine, however, if you are using that screen reader and you're tabbing through the form fields? You don't know what's associated with that. You'll end up in the smack dab in the middle of this, and you'll have no idea what that is. The label tag will allow the screen reader to associate the text with the particular form control. And the label tag looks like this. It has the word label that goes around the text. And then the four matches the ID of the control that the label is for. So for example, the words zip slash postal code belongs to this text box. And therefore I say label for txt zip. And then I give that text box an ID of txt zip. So that's what ties those two together. And if you look right down the line, this text box is txt name. The label for txt name is this. And so on down the line. Now, although the label and the field set are used for um, accessibility, they also have styling implications. All right? So let's talk about how you style a form. All right? Let's talk about how we can style a form. Oh, before we do that, one thing I want to note. Notice how these controls have both a name and an ID. It's important to be clear on the difference between those two. And it's not unheard of for a form control to have both a name and ID. And that's, that's sort of how I pretty much always do it. The name is, is what sends it to the server. All right. So the name is a name that's going to be sent by to the server. So you need that name if you're sending the data to a server, which you nearly all the time are. All right? So that's the name that's going to be given when it's sent to the server. The ID is used for styling purposes, for associating the label with the control, and it also uh, can be used in, in JavaScript coding, which we'll talk about shortly. All right? What I usually do is I will make my life easier on myself, and when I give it a, a name, I'll give it, except for radio buttons, uh, I'll give it the same ID. Now, radio buttons are a little different because radio buttons have to have the same name, but IDs have to be different. So, a radio button, I'll make an adjustment for that. But like for a text box or a button or whatever, I'll give it both a name and an ID, and I'll make them the same. That, that makes it a little, e little easier to manage. All right, now on to styling. First of all, there's a, there's a couple ways of styling forms. And I'm going, to talk about, I'm going to talk about the way that I think theoretically is the best way. And I will also, um, I think in practice it also produces the best results. You could put forms in a table, all right, and put the labels in one column and the form controls in the other column. I don't think that's a good idea because that's not truly a table of data. I think you're lying to your browser when you do that, all right, and you're not supposed to lie to your browser, all right. 
Why aren't you supposed to lie to your browser? Well, when you're lying to your browser, you're sort of subverting the intent of HTML. And in the long run, that's going to limit the flexibility of your code. All right? So in addition, given that forms and tables are both problematic for people with disabilities, when you combine the two, you, you really could have the potential for, for difficulty there. Not to say that you couldn't code your way through it, but again, you have the potential for difficulty. So we're going we're gonna to toss out tables. All right? Um, you could just have a bunch of form fields and put break tags in between them. Now, break tags aren't good. Break tags are only appearance related. So you avoid break tags. Almost anything can be accomplished without a break tag. I know if you look real closely in the previous example I cheated, it was a weak moment. I'm sorry and it will never happen again. All right. Uh, the better way to do it is to consider a form. What is a form? A form is a list of fields that you have to enter in. A form is a what? A form is a list of fields. Oh no, that's probably the web police calling to say you used a break tag in that previous example. Yeah, they're coming for me. Yeah. Um, really, if you think about it again, a form is nothing but a list of fields that we're going to enter in. And therefore, let's use the list tags to do that. So that's exactly what I do. I'm going to use the list tags to style the form or, or to, to create the form. And then later on, I'll, I'll use, use those, use the CSS related to list to style it. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to remove all the CSS to start, and I'm going to put it in another file. Then I'm gradually going to add it back in. And we can take a look at it. All right. So I removed all the CSS code. All right. Let's go and view it. Doesn't look very good, does it? By default, it puts a border around the field set and puts the legend up there. But I got all those bullet points, and look, the, the, it just looks sloppy, right? The, the, the name text box is next to the name field. The address is next to the address. But you don't have a clean margin going down this way between there. So let's gradually add pieces of this style code back in till we get it looking the way we want to. First thing I'm going to do is obviously this isn't, even though we're using a list, this isn't really a bullet point list, right? So I want to get rid of the, the bullet points next to the fields. So fine, I'll go in and do that. All right. Moving in the right direction. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go and I'm going to put some margin uh, in here to put a little bit of space between these fields. Because look, these text boxes are sort of crammed on top of each other. So I'll go and put some margin on the li tag. All right. Put some space in between. Already moving in the right direction. Then what's sort of a key thing here is I'm going to go and I'm going to set the label and give it a fixed width. And I'm going to make the display inline block and I'm going to make the text align right aligned. Let me do this part of it first. I'll leave off the text alignment. All right. And that's not bad. We might want to leave it at that. But one thing we might want to do is we want to might, might want to put the name right next to the label. And I can do that by adding in the text align right attribute. And now those are next to that. Um, 
I did a couple other things. I put, I centered the field sets and gave them a certain width. Gave them a background color. And that's most of what I did. I also I played around with the buttons just more for demonstration purposes than um, for, for actual practice. This is a case where the theoretically best way to do it also gives a very practical good solution. All right? Because what I can do is, again, with this, I can, um, you know, Make, make the columns line up, I can make the labels line up, I can uh, give some space between them, you know, all just using the list. If I wanted to, if I wanted to make part of the form oriented horizontally, I could always um, make the uh, LIs have a display of, of inline instead of block. And then I'd even have that flexibility, which if you put break tags in or use the table, you would, you would lose that flexibility. All right. Um, so each one of these field sets is its own UL tag. Why do we have to do it that way? Well, because you can't put like field sets in the middle of a UL. So you have to end this UL and start the next UL. Um, I'll, just for good measure, I'll put in the rest of the stuff dealing with the buttons just to show you how I can set any attributes. I'm setting the size of the button. I'm setting the color of it and so on. So now I have my two buttons. There's a good article in, uh, in Angel. Um, I'm not sure if it's in the accessibility section or if it is in the regular resources section, but it's called something like Pretty Accessible Forms. And I think they walk you through this sort of process the same way that I did, but that's a good one to use, use for reference. Are there any questions about this? All right. Let me map out the rest of the semester, all right, which is two more weeks, all right, which is amazing to me. I mean, I'm still wondering when we're having spring break, and I look and I see that there's two more weeks left. Um, yeah, really. Um, we don't have a final exam in this class. Your, your project is considered to be your final exam, all right. Um, next two weeks are sort of peripheral material. In other words, really, um, you know, that, uh, the next two weeks is sort of the icing on the cake. It, it, it's not the cake itself. It's not, you know, it's sort of, sort of uh, uh, some nice additional things. So I don't mind how thoroughly we cover it. I want to make sure we introduce it so that you, un so you understand um, the basic ideas of it. But priority is getting your project done, all right? Um, I, I, so I may give opportunities to work in, uh, in, in lab and have, you know, have a, a work day, maybe one of those four days, uh, or maybe have short lectures or whatever, just being aware of the, the priority of getting that done. So do make sure you have your materials, your thumb drive or whatever. You can put stuff up on Angel if you want. You all have a certain amount of space on Angel you can put stuff up on. Plus, there's a great tool called Dropbox that you can use. Not, don't be confused with the Angel Dropbox. This is, a, uh, um, this is a, 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 you know, an outside company that has, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's an awesome, awesome tool to use. Um, so you can do that. There's a lot of ways you can get the stuff uh, here to work on. The last two topics that we're going to talk about is we're going to touch on mobile web development. Now, you have an exercise, one of your last assignments is to create a page that gives some good guidelines for mobile design. We'll talk about that and we'll talk a little bit about some of the options if you have to develop a website that works on a computer computer 
versus a website that works on a mobile device, what some of the considerations are. So we'll talk about that briefly and I'll show an example of a web page that looks drastically different on a desktop versus a mobile device. So that's one thing that we're going to do. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to introduce JavaScript. And I really don't expect you to learn JavaScript um, very thoroughly, but I do expect you to have a sense of what the capabilities of JavaScript are and be able to, you know, pretty much take code that I've given you and tweak it around a little bit to make, make it work for you. All right, so that's really what the last two assignments are. I did have a request for some other material, uh, which I, will, I have in my notes. I will review that and, and I'll try to spend some time on that. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head what it was. I think it had something to do with like adding a Facebook like button to a page or something like that, how you could do that. But I'll, I'll verify that and I'll, I'll try to, to include uh, some of that stuff in uh, as well. So that's sort of, that's sort of where we're going to go. Uh, the remainder of the semester. Are there any questions? Yes? Is JavaScript what you would need to, like, say, take text from your tech, or text from your text box and place it on your website, like a form, like a, uh, yeah, like, like a comment section, like at the bottom of a news article, you got everybody posting yeah. comments? Yeah. Um, that could be done. The question is, is do you need JavaScript to implement, for example, like having comments on an article? Um, the short answer is no. You don't need JavaScript for that. The long answer is there's several different ways that you could implement that functionality. Some of them involve JavaScript. Some of them don't. But the real, real key technology in that would be some sort of server-side scripting. Because what you're going to want to do is if someone enters a new comment in, all right, you're going to want to save that somewhere so that the next person comes along and pulls up that page sees the newest comments. All right. So uh, JavaScript is a client technology, client-side technology, all right, for the most part. Uh, and therefore, it affects like interactivity within a web page. Um, Yeah, well, you see, that's a case of that's a case of a technology. The statement was, is what about like say in Facebook, where as soon as you put a comment, it appears. That's actually a technique called AJAX, and that does involve JavaScript. Um, that's where you can make changes to the page without refreshing the whole page. Typically, in in um, you know the old school web pages, to see new things from the server, you have to refresh the entire page. Ajax allows you to refresh part of the page without changing the entire page. And that's why I said that would be an example of a solution that would involve JavaScript, but it would also involve some server-side coding as well. So we'll give a, a better overview of this next week when we talk about this. Um, all right. Could it be done with strict HTML? Could it be done with strict HTML? No. No. has to be has to be some sort of server-side scripting going on to remember that comment so that the next person that comes in can, can do it. All right. We'll see you over in lab where I will show some yarn bombing pictures. If, if you are in the online class and feel cheated by this, send me an email and I'll send you a link. All right. <laughs>